All right. Um, hello, and welcome to the Fallow Seminar. Uh, before we get started, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the support of the Society of Systematic Biologists, which is now supporting Fallow Seminar. Today is the second talk uh, of a series of three talks on the promise and challenges of using fossils in phylogenetics. Our first speaker on the subject was Tracy Heath on the fossilized birth death process, and that, that talk is recorded, so you can see that. Today we have Dan Ksepka on integrating uh, fossils into phylogenies, and then Dan will be followed by Graham Slater, who will be speaking in about a week. Well, exactly a week, actually. So Dan is a paleontologist by training. He got his bachelor's in geology at Rutgers and then his master's and PhD at Columbia. And there he started working on extinct penguins, which is a significant interest of his that has continued to the present day. And looking this morning at his work, I could certainly see the appeal as this group is quite old and very diverse. So Dan is currently a researcher at NC State and Nescent. Ironically, I'm headed to Nescent this morning for a BC workshop, and my schedule is such that I won't be able to stay for Dan's whole talk. So it's going to be up to the rest of you to ask moronic questions, uh, as that is usually my role. So Dan, go ahead and take it away. Hey. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, appreciate it. Thanks also to Brian for helping organize this. So I'm going to switch um, to my desktop. And are we there? Great. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to give a phylo seminar. And this talk is going to be about including fossil taxa in phylogenies and some of the extra bits of information we can get when we include fossils in our data sets and also some of the challenges of doing so. So to start, why would we want to include fossil taxa in phylogenies? Well, we often see this quote that more than 99% of all species that have ever existed are extinct, and that's true for many, many groups. Um, as Eric said, I study penguins as one of my, my major um, organisms of interest. And in this particular group, we have about um, two-thirds of the species that have ever lived are now known only from fossils. And so by not including those taxa, uh, we'd have a very sparsely sampled phylogeny, and we'd also miss out on a lot of information about the evolution of beak shape and body size and biogeographic distributions. And fossils are also very important because they can help us understand major transitions. And so uh, we have really good molecular data, for example, that support a sister group relationship between hippos and whales amongst extant mammals. But we can spend all day staring at a hippo, which, which might fun, but um, it wouldn't tell us anything really about the evolution of features such as flippers or baleen or sonar. Uh, and we need fossils to do that, so luckily cetaceans have a really nice fossil record and we have taxa like myocetus that, that give us some transitional states and let us know how these characters evolved over time. And the same can be said of many other groups. For example, theropod dinosaurs give us a great source of information about all types of transitions in birds, the reduction of digits, the evolution of feathers, etc. And I don't mean to imply that we are only interested in fossils to learn more about living organisms. There's many very important and fascinating completely extinct clades uh, that we would like to have phylogenies of so we can understand their evolutionary history better. So groups like trilobites, um, sauropod dinosaurs, the largest land animals that have ever lived, uh, certainly we are still interested in the phylogeny of groups that are now uh, no longer with us. And finally, I think the, the main reason that most people are interested in fossils is for temporal data, to get some information about the timing of major evolutionary events and how they uh, correlate to things like climate change or plate tectonic events or the evolution of other groups that uh, may be competitors. Um, so we can do this through many different methods. Divergence dating analyses let us indirectly uh, use the phylogenetic content of fossils we need to know where the fossils belong in a phylogeny to correctly use them um, as calibration points in these analyses, but they don't have its analysis themselves. And so we can use the age and the phylogenetic placement of these fossils to come up with prior uh, probability distributions for the age of different nodes. 
And there are also newer methods like the fossilized birth death process, which Tracy Heath talked about in the last Philo seminar. And uh, this method uses the entire fossil record of a group to marginalize over fossil attachment points on the cladogram. And so, so this can use um, a little bit more than just the oldest fossil of each clade to help get at time. And these are really interesting methods and, and really important methods and a lot of work's being done with these methods right now. However, I won't really talk about them anymore in this presentation because um, here we're focused mostly on including the fossils directly into the phylogenetic analysis. So the flip side of that question, why do we include fossils, is uh, why are fossils often excluded from analyses? And there are many reasons that are either stated explicitly or kind of implied. Uh, one of the most common is that there's no morphological data set available. And that's, of course, more of a logistical difficulty. Someone needs to go out and collect that data. So this keeps paleontologists like myself in business. Um, a kind of more troubling uh, reason may be that introducing missing data can negatively impact the analysis. And, um, there's a lot of debate over how severe the effects of missing data may be depending on the optimality criterion you're using and how that missing data is distributed. And a lot of good work's been done on that and we will touch on a few of those issues later in the talk. But by far my least favorite answer is adding the fossil tax will have no overall effect on the results. Um, and this is something that can't be said to be true a priori. You have to do the analysis first. And many recent studies have shown that fossils can affect the placement of even the extant taxa relative to one another. Not um, to say, of course, that including them is going to make the phylogeny more complete because we're adding them into the tree, even if the relationships of extant taxa don't change. And here's a recent example from some work um, I participated in. This is a study led by Sterling Nesbitt. Uh, Julia Clark and myself were also co-authors on this, and we were looking at this weird big mouth bird. This is Fluvio viridravis platyramphus. It's a fossil frog mouth from the Green River Formation, and in this study we used um, molecular data from three genes and about 200 morphological characters. And what we found is the frog mouths and the oil birds formed a clade in our result when we included all the data and all the fossils. However, when we excluded all of the fossils, this clade collapsed. And that's because there's some interesting transitional morphologies preserved in these fossils that aren't present in the crown members of these lineages. And so by including those fossils, we get that extra information, and there's hidden synapomorphies that support um, this oil bird frogmouth clade. And so that's just a recent example and one where we get a different perspective on the relationships of living birds using fossil data. And this also speaks to the fact that morphological data can be important even if we have a lot of molecular data available as well. It's the signal and not the amount of codings that matters. Okay, so question two. What do fossil data actually look like? Well, this is the best case scenario. This is Limno frigata, a fossil frigate bird from the Field Museum of Natural History collection. And this is a complete articulated skeleton. You can basically get just about every piece of information um, on skeletal morphology from this specimen as you could from a, a fresh skeleton of an extant bird. But this is the exception and not the rule. These are the fossils we see in museums. These are the types of fossils that are often holotypes or, or given names because they're so complete and informative and aesthetically pleasing. But more often, we're dealing with cases like this. So this ugly piece of bone is the holotype of Paleodiptes antarcticus. This is the first fossil penguin ever discovered. And it was actually described by Thomas Henry Huxley himself. And so this was described in the 1850s. It's not too informative because we only have a single element here. This is a foot bone. But it's something we basically have to deal with if we want to learn about the evolution of early penguins because it is very important taxonomically. Many other specimens have been assigned to it. It's important biogeographically because um, similar fossils have been found in New Zealand, where this specimen's from, and Antarctica. And so if they really do belong to the same clade, then we have some interesting biogeographic relationship there. And we have many other examples of fossils like this. The oldest specimen or the only specimen from a particular area is not very complete. And so we have two choices, ignore it or try to figure out where it goes. And this means dealing with missing data. And missing data is going to be omnipresent and is often or always going to be unevenly distributed when we're dealing with fossils. 
So this image is actually from a paper, a kind of rebuttal arguing that Archaeopteryx um, is a bird and dinosaurs have nothing to do with birds and the actual data is for a really good analysis uh, stating exactly the opposite. And I was kind of puzzled that they use this. Basically, the point of this figure appearing in that rebuttal paper was to say that, uh, look how much missing data there is. We can't trust these analyses. But a lot of these birds, you know, these Cretaceous birds, are actually really well representative, represented in the data set compared to other taxa. So we have um, many sources of missing data. We can have incomplete specimens where bones have been lost or damaged. We can have non-preservation of characters, and this is a little bit more insidious because we lose entire classes of characters, and so the, the removal of codings is non-random. For example, um, in birds, we're typically not going to have soft tissue. We may have feathers, but we're unlikely to have any characters of the organs or the muscles, for example. We'll almost always have complete absence of molecular data. There's a few really nice examples where we'll have sequence data from things like um, mammoths taken from permafrost, but typically there's not going to be any at all. And this can result in very low percentages of the total matrix being um, of characters being coded for a fossil taxon because we have maybe 10% of the morphological characters and 0% of the molecular characters. And finally, this Sample size is quite often one, and this makes it difficult to deal with issues like sexual dimorphism or ontogenetic variation because we just have the specimens to properly um, understand how variation affects the character's issue, or um, we have perhaps little data on how old a specimen is, and thereby um, we, we lose the ability to tell if a character might be developed over the course of ontogeny or not. And finally, um, just a point about collecting morphological data in general, and this can be from living taxa or fossil taxa. Typically, apomorphies are explicitly ignored in the matrix construction phase. So here we have a kiwi skull, and this is the only bird that has its nostrils at the very tip of its beak. And that's a really unique character, but it's unlikely that there's going to be a character um, formulated for a morphological matrix that says nostrils at end of beak, yes or no, because that character is just going to be an apomorphy and won't be useful in the context of parsimony um, phylogenetic analysis. And we also see that invariant characters are basically never collected. And I'd argue that they're essentially impossible to collect for a morphological data set. Um, think about an example in birds. If we wanted to see how many morphological characters don't change over the course of a tree, we can add characters like feathers present or brain present that are present for every bird. And that starts to give us an idea of how many characters are not changing at all. There's no real way to draw the line. Do we also add four-chambered heart present, note accord present, etc.? There's really no boundary there. And so uh, we can collect apomorphies if we're careful. But collecting invariant characters is just not um, a, a task that we can really address in morphology. And this is one of the ways that morphological data really differs from molecular data when we're talking about things like um, calculating rate. OK, so now let's look at some ways, some methods, for including fossils and phylogenies. Widely used at present are parsimony methods implemented in programs like POP and TNT. Uh, these are generally intuitive for the treatment of morphological data. It's very easy to understand how to order characters. Um, we have a relatively good understanding of how missing data is going to affect support values and things like that in a parsimony framework. But on the flip side, we have the negative of we're forced to treat our molecular data um, in the same way as the morphological data. And this could expose us to problems like uh, long branch attraction under certain scenarios. Nonetheless, um, these methods have been applied to a lot of recent data sets. Here's an example um, from my own work. This is a paper describing a new fossil representative of the podiform lineage that includes the, the modern um, swifts and uh, hummingbirds. And I, I chose this example because this is a combined data set including data from five genes and a morphological character set. And the fossils are distributed throughout the Tree. And so we have a diverse array of stem and crown fossils. Um, they're not just all hanging out at the base of the tree. And this is also a kind of nice 
case because the combined analysis and the morphology only analysis provide the same topology with the exception of one extra branch collapsing. And so this is a case where we can be um, pretty happy with the placement of the fossils and, and um, the fact that the morphological data is giving us the same basic signal as the molecular data. There are some issues, though, um, and some of these will apply to any types of methods. Others are specific to parsimony, and one of them is that support values um, can really be affected negatively by the inclusion of fossil data. And I, I want to make a distinction. If we're including a fossil placement and the support value is low for that branch, that's just fine because we don't want to have false confidence in that branch. The problem is that these support values can decrease throughout the tree because of the inclusion of a particular fossil. So let's say we have a situation here where we have um, Bremer support values that are relatively high for this small phylogeny. And then we find this really fascinating toe bone. So we have this, this fossil bird claw and it has some character that lets us um, propose that it's a sister taxon of taxon A. That's really interesting, and if we have a good character, um, we can put it there, and that may tell us something about the age of this clade, or its biogeographic history, if this is from a different region than um, this, this clade lives today. But the problem is, um, if we have only one character supporting this placement, this fossil can go anywhere else on the tree for one additional step, and the support values are going to be one throughout the phylogeny. And this can be a real issue that discourages the inclusion of fossils because if you have really so low support values, people will be less confident in your phylogeny. Uh, you can even run into trouble um, at the review stage where people say, well, this must not be a good matrix because look at the terrible support values. And it's important to distinguish whether these are low because of actual uncertainty be in the relationships between different taxa or um, the inclusion of one bad apple fossil. And there are ways to get around this to a certain extent. Uh, Wilkinson and colleagues proposed a method called double decay analysis. And this provides a, mean of a, a means of assessing support for all n taxon statements within a tree. And this can help us detect underlying support. Basically, we take each permutation of taxa um, in the total tree and calculate support values for branches when we only include those in the analysis and let the others freely float around the phylogeny. And the actual output for a double decay analysis is a very large table with results for all these possible trees. That can be a little bit difficult to digest, but one particularly informative case is looking at the way that this affects things when we exclude the fossils, um, or, or rather let the fossils move freely and see how the relationships of the other taxa, the living taxa, are supported. So here's a good example from a recent study by Geisler and colleagues. And this is looking at the evolution of baleen whales. I've always been jealous of people who study whales because they're kind of tube-shaped animals and they sit really neatly at the right-hand side of your trees if you want to label um, those trees graphically. And in this case we see uh, pretty bad support for all of these clades in this particular section of the phylogeny. And this is just a subsection. The real tree includes a very large amount of taxa. Have different whales, the fin whale and the humpback whale at the top, for example, have a Bremer support value of only two. Well, um, to distinguish underlying support, Geisler et al. looked at the values when we let the fossils float, and here we see that they go up by two orders of magnitude in some cases. And so that um, fin whale and humpback whale clade that didn't look very well supported actually receives a support value of 106 when we um, take that into consideration. Obviously the branch placing the fossil uh, has no support now because the fossil is freely floating. And other branches which are actually not very well supported in the uh, molecular and morphological data set for the extant taxa like the placement of the pygmy fin whale, they still receive low support. So this can be a useful tool um, for kind of distinguishing how fossils are impacting other areas of the tree. And finally, I'd like to point out that a lot of paleontologists think of Bremer values almost as a measure of missing record. And this is because, logically, um, as new fossil taxa are added, they have to attach somewhere to the phylogeny. And as they break up internal branches, um, characters that are supporting 
um, a clade that's on that branch that's being broken up are going to shift either upward or downward. So here's um, an example from my own work on parrots. We had a phylogeny where we looked at the support for the living parrots from morphological data, and we had a Bremer support value of 35. When we included several fossils, including really nice, complete skeletons like this one shown here, this is Cyril Avis, a parrot from the Green River Formation, um, a lot of the characters of the skull are now of crown clade parrots, but a lot of the characters of the foot, the unique grasping foot of parrots, evolved earlier and are now synapomorphies of the total group, including the fossil stem taxa and the crown taxa. And that results in the Bremer support for the living parrots going down from 39 to 5. And that doesn't mean that's not a really well-supported group, it just means that we're breaking up the branch. Okay, so those are uh, What about including fossils in model-based approaches? So Paul Lewis designed the MKV model for morphological data, and this is basically a modified version of the Jukes-Cantor model, uh, which assumes that all states have the same frequency and transitions between different states occur at the same rate. And so this is conditional on only variable characters being sampled, and that's certainly something that's usually true for morphological matrices. Again, we don't include um, characters that don't change when we're constructing those data matrices. And Nylander and colleagues also noted that likely calculation should be conditioned based on parsimony informative ascertainment biases, uh, which can be implemented in, in programs such as Mr. Bayes. And so it's not only that we're including only variable characters, we're generally also excluding um, apomorphies that, that don't inform uh, parsimony analysis when these data are originally being collected. So let's take a look at a case where we apply a model-based approach to an all-morphological data set, or in this case, an all-fossil data set. Recently, there is some uh, question as to whether Archaeopteryx is a bird, and this is a real easy way to get paleontologists kind of in an uproar by asking this question. And it was um, a debate that started with a paper published by Xu Xing and colleagues in Nature in 2011. And here's the figure that appeared in that paper. Uh, You know, the total tree, if you look in the supplement, you'll see that many clades are collapsed here, and there's also many outgroups that aren't shown. And so the real data matrix is much larger than this. And basically what we're seeing is, here's Archaeopteryx, and it's in a clade that includes a lot of kind of normal dinosaurs like Velociraptor. And here are all the other birds that were included in the analysis, and they form a separate clade over here. So there's two possible ways to interpret this data. Either Archaeopteryx is not a bird after all, but is some weird tiny dinosaur, or all of these taxa on this cladogram are birds, and things like Velociraptor are secondarily flightless and larger taxa. So this obviously was um, of great importance to understanding the early evolution of birds, and there was a kind of reply paper by Mike Lee and Trevor Worthy published in Biology Letters. And they re-ran the same data set using Raxamel and Mr. Bayes um, and got very different results. And so basically what they're doing is taking the exact same character data, the same ordering strategies, et cetera, and rerunning the analysis. And so here Archaeopteryx returns to its normal position with other birds in the likelihood tree. And in the Bayesian tree, we see the same result. Archaeopteryx is supported as part of birds. The branch lengths leading to this clade uh, are relatively long, and, and the Bayesian support value of one is particularly quite high. So what's going on here? Well, we can't blame this on different character coding choices because the matrix is the same. And so what the authors did is look at the parsimony tree and the likelihood in Bayesian trees, and they found that the parsimony tree is supported by more overall characters, which is just logical because parsimony was used, and that characters favoring that topology the one excluding Archaeopteryx from birds, have lower consistency indices and retention indices. And this means they show uh, more homoplasia in the data set. On the other hand, in the likelihood in Bayesian trees that place Archaeopteryx within birds, uh, these are supported by fewer overall characters, but those characters have higher consistency and retention indices and include some unique apomorphies. And I put a little asterisk there because these are apomorphies that are unique in the context of that topology. 
And so what this is showing is that we can look at the same data in two different ways and because we're taking into account branch length and, and rates of change in characters, we actually end up um, putting Archeopteryx, Opti Archeopteryx back with birds in the model-based approach. And before leaving this example, I just wanted to point out that uh, this particular debate over where Archaeopteryx goes is, is active in the dinosaur and bird phylogeny community, um, but it's not entirely confined to choice of optimality. Uh, Archaeopteryx belongs within AVs based on parsimony data, but using a different set of characters. So there's also argument over uh, whether some characters are redundant um, how characters should be ordered and the way they should be coded in certain taxa. Well, let's move on um, to a model-based framework where we want to combine morphological data and molecular data. And this is um, a really promising um, avenue where we can include the full amount of data, include all of the fossils, include all of the molecular sequence data, and try to get a really holistic um, idea of the evolution of a group. So let's take an example with penguins. Um, Kristen Lamb, who works in Jeff Thorne's lab at NC State, uh, presented some results, which I'm about to show in the next few slides, at a recent conference. And she was looking at a fossil penguin data set that I've published on um, a few different times, um, mostly in a parsimony framework. And so here is the parsimony phylogeny. So what we see here are at the top outgroups. In the blue box, we see a long um, interval of stem lineage fossils. So every taxa highlighted there is a fossil, and um, they're all outside the crown clade of penguins. And then uh, the crown clade, which all includes a few fossil taxa. Now, if we look at Bayesian tree, and this is from an analysis in Mr. Bayes, we see that in this tree, the fossils no longer fall out as a long series of successive sister tacks along the stem, but instead we have several new all fossil clades. And those red dots indicate um, the clades that are not present in the um, parsimony analysis. And otherwise, the relationships of the crown penguins and the outgroups are pretty much the same. There is, um, I think, two slight changes in the um, branching pattern in the crown, but very, very minor differences. Now, looking more closely, some of these notes can be supported by plausible synapomorphy. So if we scroll through character optimizations, we'll see that some of these nodes have one or two characters that support this topology, even though um, the majority of characters would argue for the parsimony trait. So that could be due to um, different rates of evolution in the character data, and that would be viewed by most as, as just fine. However, some of these nodes uh, can't be supported by any possible synapomorphy. There's no character evidence for them in the morphology data set. And that's a little bit disturbing, especially because the support values for some of these are very high. Unfortunately, they're not labeled on this tree, but we have values for these unsupported nodes, so to speak, of as high as 98, or sorry, 0 0.989. So Kristen made the case that this peculiar topology could be an artifact of a misspecified tree prior. Now, the conventional vis wisdom is that the choice of prior should have a relatively limited impact on posterior distribution. Uh, given that information from the morphological and molecular data. But if we have a situation where there's a very high proportion of missing data and a low number of informative characters, which is exactly the situation, one of those penguins is that foot bone I showed you before, um, then we have a case where an appropriate prior becomes critical. So let's look at a uniform prior on tree shape in the case where we have exactly four taxa and rooted trees. We have two shapes. On the right, we have a perfectly balanced shape, and on the left, we have a perfectly unbalanced shape. And when we label these shapes with possible arrangements of tip taxa, we have 15 possible topologies, and 12 of those are unbalanced. Again, on the left, and three balance on the right. When we consider um, ranked topologies, We have, I'm sorry, I had a microphone problem. We have 12 unbalanced trees and six balanced trees. So under a prior that's uniform on ranked topologies, it becomes more and more likely a priori that we have a more balanced tree. 
So this is a reconstructed birth death process, and we have um, speciation occurring with a certain rate and extinction occurring with a certain rate. And at the end of that, we sample contemporaneous lineages. So I'm sure this is old news to many of you, but um, many people are often surprised to learn that the reconstructed birth death process does not explicitly consider the presence of extinct taxa. Instead, we only have the contemporaneously sampled taxa uh, under consideration, and all of these other branches are excluded um, in the final result. So programs like Mr. Beast and I'm sorry, Mr. Pace and Beast currently let you choose from a variety of tree priors, but for a long time the uniform prior was the only one available, um, not because it's particularly biologically meaningful, but because it's easy to implement. And it's still actually fairly widely used um, in studies. So let's take a look at our taxon scenario again. When all four of these taxa are sampled contemporaneously, we again have our 12 unbalanced trees and our six balanced trees, and each is considered equally likely a priori. But let's imagine that one of the taxa is a fossil. Um, if the fossil sampled from the recent past, we don't really expect much to change. But as we send that fossil farther and farther back in time, it becomes more and more likely that D split from the common ancestor of A, B, and C, rather than being the sister taxon to any of these. And if we send it infinitely back in time, it's practically guaranteed that the tree will be perfectly on balanced as D becomes um, more and more likely to be the first taxon to branch off. So when we have a stem lineage leading to a crown clade, a high proportion of missing data and a low number of informative characters, a misspecified tree prior has the potential to mislead us. And this is the situation we're talking about here where we have these stem fossils. They're arranged as such, and there's not very many characters available from them. Um, we risk going from this to this. And this situation actually can get worse under reconstructed birth death prior because um, it prefers balanced trees even more strongly than a uniform prior does. So this really highlights the importance of thinking carefully about the peculiar nature of fossil information. It's, fairly different than what we're used to dealing with when we're sampling um, taxa for molecular sequences. And it also motivates the development of serial, serially sampled birth death processes that um, let one take this temporal information into account. So uh, people like Tanya Sattler have come up with computationally tractable methods for generating prior distributions based on the birth death process. And when you think about how evolution works with lineages arising by speciation, and going extinct by extinction, this seems like a much more um, relevant and natural choice. So it's really exciting that, that those methods are um, being developed and perfected um, right now. So one way to, to deal with these time issues is to include the fossils directly as data tips. And those penguin um, phylogenies I was showing you, the fossils were just all um, included as terminal tax, but we weren't including the age information directly in the analysis. And so methods have been developed to allow us to do that. Um, Pyron was the first to include fossils as data tips in a Bayesian framework. And here, the combined analysis is treating each fossil as a distinct taxa with its own branching time. So it can occur at any time before the present. And the divergence times are based on relaxed clock methods for molecular data and rates of morphological evolution. And one of the really, really nice things about these types of approaches is it eliminates some of the um, subjectivity um, in defining a prior distribution in a typical divergence dating study. You don't need to worry about the shape of the um, prior or where to draw maximum or things like that because we just use the best estimate of the date of the fossil itself. And of course, Ronquist and others have done a lot of work um, in this framework, including fossils directly. Um, here's an example looking at some insects, and we see that when the fossils are um, actually included simultaneously in the analysis, some of the proposed calibration point fossils actually went in different places. And so that's kind of uh, a really um, basic point, but something that we need to be careful of. If our fossils are being placed in a phylogenetic context in a separate analysis that may only include morphological data, it can actually be non-trivial to place them at a node in the phylogeny um, when we're assigning priors. And so using this data tip approach really helps kind of sidestep that issue. 
And um, Ronquist and colleagues also showed in this particular study that uh, the more fossil tax are, are, that are included, the um, smaller the width of the confidence intervals. And this again can be a, a very non-trivial thing because in some cases we have confidence intervals that are uh, spanning entire geological time periods. Uh, it doesn't really give us too much context to say that a particular divergence happened sometime in the Mesozoic. And so if we can reduce those, it can really help in um, testing different hypotheses. And finally, here's a, another example from a study by um, Wood et al. Systematic biology. fossils from different arachnids and in this case all of the fossils are from the northern hemisphere and all the living taxa are from the southern hemisphere so we're really adding a lot of information by including the fossil data and using this tip dating approach these authors showed that uh, vicarious events can be linked to continental breakup um, in some of these subclades here so there's a lot of promise in these methods and I think they're one of the most exciting things that's happening right now for paleontologists because our morphological data sets and um, the age estimates for fossils are becoming ever more important and used in a lot more diverse ways than they have been in the past. So I'd now like to touch on the use of stratigraphic data in phylogenies, and in particular how we can use the distribution of fossils in the stratigraphic record to either test different phylogenetic hypotheses or to get a little bit of extra information out of our trees. So here's a case where we have a small phylogeny of penguins and if we know how these animals are related to one another and where they go in the rock record, we can use that information, for example, to compare competing hypotheses. So here we might have one um, tree that suggest this set of relationships and if we look at the minimum implied gaps that is the, the smallest stratigraphic gaps that are implied by this topology we'd see that there's a very large gap at the base of the tree and two smaller gaps higher up um, and this would suggest there's 70 million years in total gaps or ghost lineages here well, how can we use that information? There are many different ways. Um, one way is we can test competing hypotheses. If someone has an alternate hypothesis that the, the penguin at the bottom, Waimanu, is the sister taxon to the crown clade, we can look at how that topology compares. And in this case, it fits the stratigraphic record much worse. It opens up several new longer gaps, and now we have 130 million years in ghost lineages. And so this um, phylogeny would be said to fit the stratigraphic record much more poorly than the first one. So this is a nice kind of independent source of data for evaluating hypotheses and besides just totaling up raw gaps there are many other indices that have been proposed. So what I was showing you there is the measure of ghost lineages, the smallest gaps implied by the phylogeny. We can also look at things like the Manhattan stratigraphic measure um, which is calculated as the minimum possible number of gaps by comparing to the best fit phylogeny um, divided by the implied number of gaps of the phylogeny we're testing or the gap excess ratio which is calculated as the maximum possible number of gaps if we had the tree that fit the stratigraphic record the worst minus the implied gaps divided by the maximum number of gaps minus the minimum number of gaps and um, MSM scales to one GER um, can become negative if there is a poor enough fit or a large enough number uh, or length of gaps so all of these things can be calculated automatically using a really neat program called ASK um, that was created by Clint Boyd. Um, and this is assistance with stratigraphic consistency calculations. And I think these methods are um, relatively underused. They're easy to calculate now, and they don't have to be limited to groups that are only represented by fossils. We can also apply them to living groups. Uh, example, um, look at the oldest occurrences of different families of mammals or reptiles and compare phylogenies that way. So this program automates calculation of all of those values and what's great about ASK is it allows us to accommodate uncertainty. So if we have a phylogeny from parsimony that has polytomies in it in a strict consensus tree or if we want to collapse clades with very low support values in a model-based framework we can look at the best and worst possible resolutions of those nodes, of, of those polytomies, and get the full range of values. And ASK also allows you to accommodate stratigraphic uncertainty. And 
that's often a really important thing when we're talking about fossils. The best case scenario is when we have a species or an animal or plant, I rather, that dies and is buried in an ash layer, and we actually date that ash layer with something like potassium argon methods. We may have an error bar that's just a few tens or hundreds of thousands of years in that case, but for the majority of the fossil record, we're relying on less direct means, um, correlations from biostratigraphy or from paleomagnetic data, and the error bars can be millions or even tens of millions of years. And so by giving the fossils the full possible range of ages and sampling thousands of times from those possibilities, we can get a much better idea of how uncertainty affects our results. And Clint and I have um, used this, this, this method in a few different ways. Um, Here's an example uh, where there was a molecular phylogeny for penguins that posited an Eocene origin of the crown clade. So this is a really great study by Baker and colleagues, and it had a really strongly supported phylogeny that told us some interesting things about penguin evolution. But the dates seemed really old. So um, Julia Clark and myself and Clint Boyd um, were involved in this study where we looked at the fossil record of penguins and penguin phylogeny. And you can see here's the crown clade in that blue box. There's basically no crown penguin fossil older than 10 million years, but there are thousands of penguin fossils that range in age from 62 million years to the present. Just the fact is that most of them are stem lineage penguins. And so we compared um, how much added missing record was required by this um, divergence dating study, and it was between 164 and 334 million additional, um, additional million years of missing record that was required to explain this. And that's a lot for a group like penguins, which are marine birds that inhabit shallow water environments and often make it into the fossil record. So interestingly enough, there was a study published just a few weeks ago that looked at penguin divergence dating again and used a different calibration regime which relied on crown penguin fossils instead of fossils from outgroups. And this placed the origin of the crown at about 20 billion years, so a much better fit. And um, we hope, at least partially, motivated by the discord between previous results and the fossil record. We can also use these methods to take a peek at the historical patterns in discovery for different groups. And, and Clint and I tried this in birds. We developed a method where we basically split a phylogeny and we assign the stratigraphic range historical time bin. So we can ask, for example, uh, how old was the oldest record of penguins in 1910 and in 1920 and so on. And, and doing this allows us to keep any discoveries from actually creating more missing record by changing the shape of the tree. So we set the present as the um, frame of reference. And here's what we have in 1910 for birds. There's almost three billion years in gaps. So each of these dashed lines indicates um, a ghost lineage, and the black lines indicate the fossil ranges for these taxa. And this is based on a phylogeny published by Hackett and colleagues in 2008. And it basically includes every order of birds. And in the cases where those orders were found to be um, non-monophyletic, we included family-level taxa. As we move forward in time, things get a little bit better, but by 1970, we still have more than 2 billion years worth of gaps. And what we found is, in the last few decades, since the 1980s, we've had a real increase in the completeness of the fossil record. So all these red bars are discoveries made between um, 1980 and 2010, and now we basically cut things in half. So we have great new discoveries like this frigate bird, um, and this shows that gaps have been cut in half over the past century. To me, that's interesting just from a historical perspective, but I some biological significance because what we're finding is if we look at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary as represented by that blue dashed line, more than 99% of the gains in, um, in completeness are in the Cenozoic. So even though we're finding birds on every continent and from all different types, of clades and from all type of different types of environments, terrestrial environments, marine environments, lake environments, they're all still mostly from Cenozoic lineages. And so this makes it, to me, less and less likely that we're going to push all of these lineages back, for example, into the early Cretaceous. If we have divergence dating studies that support radiation of most modern birds at 100 million years or more in the past, that requires more missing record than we had even in 1910, and we require adding billions of years of missing record. And that just doesn't seem very plausible. We can look at this also from kind of a, um, his, a, a sampling perspective. Um, here, the gray line indicates the amount of missing record based on uh, all fossils 
when they're assigned to the clay they were um, placed in at the age of discovery. And the black line indicates the amount of missing record when we consider the phylogenetic information we have today. And so the gap between the lines indicates kind of the missed potential um, in terms of fossils that weren't identified when they were found. They weren't placed in the correct clade. And obviously they, they converge towards the because we're using the present as a frame of reference. But this shows that not only were new discoveries important, but also the development of, of phylogenetic methods and taking a new look at known fossils. And this graph also suggests we, we've kind of started tailing off the golden age of bird discovery and we're slowly starting to reach an asymptote. And if you kind of continue this line, uh, we might expect to start um, running out of new fossil discoveries that reduce um, the ghost lineages by large amounts in 2060 or so. And this method can also be um, extended to apply to groups that don't have living representatives. So here's an example where um, we let new discoveries extend the record either forward in time or backward in time for dinosaurs. And this is some work that my student Alyssa Stubbs has been doing with Clint and myself. And um, the colors indicate the historical time the discoveries were made. So range extending discoveries from the early part of the 1800s are in blue. And as we go towards warmer colors, those are discoveries taking place closer to today. And so um, the hot red part of the bottom of the cladogram is representing a lot of the new discoveries of feathered theropod dinosaurs that have taken places, uh, taken place in uh, localities um, such as China and Mongolia. And finally, I'd like to wrap the talk up with a, a brief advertisement targeted at people who are involved in um, placing fossils in phylogenies because we really need you um, for a new initiative. Um, we're constructing a database here at Nescent of vetted fossil calibration points. So this began as a project um, funded by the Encyclopedia of Life, which produced a best practices paper in systematic biology led by Jim Parham um, and co-authored by this large group shown here. And it's been continuing at Nescent um, in this working group called Synthesizing and Databasing Fossil Calibrations, Divergence and Beyond. So we are partnering with the journal Paleontologia Electronica, and our goal here is to publish calibrations for divergence dating studies that have been vetted both phylogenetically and stratigraphically and are based on specimen level fossils. Um, and these are all points uh, kind of articulated in the Parham et al. paper. And so we're looking for contributions right now. Any um, paper describing calibration points can be published here. It's open access, it's peer reviewed, it's indexed, and the papers will be directly linked to the database. So here is a, a prototype version of what this database will look like. Say you were interested in a fossil calibration for the split between cats and dogs. Um, you can search there. And um, in this case, this is all test data. We're just working on the, um, the functionality right now, so the dates are a little bit imprecise. But you see that we have one calibration, and it's based on this particular fossil here. Um, the minimum suggested age is 37.2. And more importantly, we, we've linked directly to that paper. So hopefully the paleontologists who have done all this work will get the citation credit they deserve. And um, additionally, we're, we're linking into other um, electronic resources like NCBI and the paleobiology database for um, people who are interested in going a little bit deeper and looking at taxonomic history or more about the geology of that fossil. Um, they can get that e extra information. Uh, and those looking for sequence data can go right to NCBI and see how many sequences are available for cats and dogs. And, and for those two species, it's um, I think in the hundreds of thousands. Well, that is, is it. Um, I'd like to thank especially Kristen Lamb for providing those really interesting slides on um, some of her unpublished work, and to all the collaborators whose work was um, featured here, funding from Nesson, of course, and um, also for NSF for some of the penguin and other fossil bird work um, that was included in this presentation. Um, thanks very much, and I'm opening my browser. I'd be happy to take any questions now if we have some. I'm back. I, I can't hear you, Brian. Sorry. Thanks very much, Daniel. It was a great talk. Um, oh, there, there you go. Sorry. I saw, I saw, I saw you talking. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you letting me know. I would have just <laughs> kept going. 
Uh, anybody who'd like to ask a question, please just use the Ask a Question button in the, uh, the Google Plus viewer. Uh, the question will pop up, and Daniel can answer them. Uh, otherwise, if we don't have any questions, then on we go. Well, I guess I did have one quick question. Uh, it's probably kind of basic, but how difficult is it to uh, to mesh up the the stratigraphic data with the uh, phylogenetic data? So you can do it in um, different ways. In the stuff that Clint and I did, we had the phylogeny already from other sources, and uh, we can input that tree into ask and then assign the dates. And it's a really nice interface. You can actually click on the geologic time scale if you're using um, predefined units. So. Or a Nexus tree, right? Or, or other formats there. Okay. All right. Well, I guess that's it. All right. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Well, for again, Daniel, thank you very much for. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye. <laughs> You're very welcome. Bye-bye.